morning, good afternoon, good evening from France to our panelists and to all the participants wherever you are. Um, I have the honor of moderating today's session where we will hear from a very distinguished panel representing the European Commission, France, the US National Institute of Standards and Technology, the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers, better known as IEEE, um, and the European Standardization Committee's SENSINIDEC. So we're here today to discuss standardization, which is about establishing uniform engineering or technical uh, criteria, methods, processes, and practices. And there are many different kinds of standards, but today we will focus uh, mostly on mostly technical, but also process standards um, and on standard development activities in the area of trustworthy or responsible artificial intelligence. Um, and standards are key to ensure some uniformity in implementing the values we care about in the AI system lifecycle, including human rights, uh, for the uh, brought up uh, at length in the previous panel, um, and to allow interoperability between different systems and companies uh, while preventing lock-in. They also allow a wide technical community to scrutinize proposals. And uh, although sometimes the decision-making procedures are complex, um, and there are barriers to entry um, um, into these processes, they're necessary uh, and critical. And uh, so I suspect we'll hear more about that. So we have 70 minutes for the panel and we'll structure it, the panel into three parts. First, we'll focus on the AI standards and benchmark lands benchmarks landscape today. What kind of standards are we talking about? Why? Uh, why does it matter to create standards for trustworthy AI in the first place? Um, standards to accomplish what exactly? Uh, and where are we at in developing standards and benchmarks for AI? Who's been doing what so far? Um, second, we will discuss opportunities for international interoperability and particularly for cross-Atlantic interoperability and cooperation on standards, including uh, looking, at, in looking at what are the gaps and what needs to be done to fill these gaps. And, we'll try to project ourselves uh, just a few years from now and imagine what would success look like uh, in the standardization area for our panelists and, and identify some of the uh, top near-term priorities moving forward one to three years uh, from now, so really near-term. So without further ado, let's get started. Um, so uh, we start with uh, our first uh, the first section of our panel on AI standards and benchmarks on the AI standards and benchmarks landscape. Um, where are we at today? Um, so we'll start with uh, Constantinos. Um, Constantinos, you are um, not appearing on my. I cannot see Constantinos. I see you. Okay. It's a scroll. Um, so, Constantinos, you're the director of the IEEE, which is a global st uh, standard development organization that's been working on AI uh, for a very long time, uh, at least as long as I've been working on AI, which was in 2016, um, when policymakers at the OECD and elsewhere started to turn their attention to AI, um, and you very much helped raise awareness, um, their awareness uh, about the importance of this topic. So, Constantinos, could you get us started? by explaining why we need standards for trustworthy or responsible AI, standards and benchmarks for what, and where is the IEEE at in terms of developing standards and benchmarks for AI? Thank you, Karin. And I very much remember the day I came to ICD with uh, my people and we had these discussions. And this started really your work there. And uh, well, we started several years ago for several reasons and standards can serve really several purposes. So this is a very good question. Uh, IEEE were a global democracy of technical experts. So what we do serves mainly our standards is to give instructions to ourselves how to do a better job. And they are very often also used by regulators or policy makers and so on. But the main purpose is to help our peers to do a better job in the design of systems. And uh, when we started uh, putting on the table the issue of uh, artificial intelligence and so in, uh, and these systems, the question was, what are you doing there? 
there is no problem. Just let the technology evolve. Uh, it is very premature. It is very early. You're going to hinder innovation. We didn't listen to these voices because we believe that, uh, that these technologies and systems have really a potential to be very intrusive and very pervasive in our everyday lives. And as somebody already mentioned, they are socio-technical systems. They are not just technical. That means we, as technical people, must assume our share of responsibility and to address these things as socio-technical, not only technical. And of course, many people don't like this because we are not used to do these things, but we have to. So we started very early and uh, we created global communities and they started very early to create standardization projects. So we are very mature now. Many of these projects now became standards and start uh, really their, uh, their path in the marketplace and so on. And uh, we are very pleased to see this happening because uh, for instance, if we take this standard uh, IEEE 7000, it is the first ever which allows uh, technical people, system designers, Oh, yeah. To... It's okay. It's okay. Yeah. Yes. It, it, uh, am I okay to continue? So it, it allows uh, technical people and system designers to uh, do a better job by including non purely technical criteria into the system design. And this enlarges really the, uh, the way of our thinking. And uh, makes, uh, by the way, this expression from uh, principles to practice, this goes the title of our introductory chapter in ethical aligned design. And now it is used worldwide and we mean it. So it is not sufficient to have uh, high level principles. We must turn it to a level where technical people can do their work. And this is the main reason of IEEE standards. And we have now several of them in this area and uh, we are very pleased also to see that other organizations have been inspired by this and they're also developing families of standards. We do not regard this as competition. We're very pleased this happens because it goes about a paradigm change in reality. We need it to convince the technical people to address these things which are soft things. They're not hard, it's not hardware. Eh? And this is now happening. So, and this, is hope. this gives raise for hope. So yes, uh, and to conclude, our standards serve the purpose of, uh, for better design. And second, we are working very closely with policymakers in several countries and regions, uh, listening to what they need. If they do a regulation, for instance, the regulation cannot do everything. They, it, can, it must stop at a level of abstraction. So what we work with them to deliver them the tools to make this regulation work in practice in the marketplace. And this is a, a, another reason for making standards. And for this, we made an, make an appeal to the global communities to work closely with policy makers and regulators because only together we can win this battlefield. And of course, the companies, they have also their business interests and so on, but this is not sufficient. We, they cannot self-regulate here. We need also the consciousness of the technical people and the regulatory intervention of the regulators. And we have to work together to make this happen. And we are part of this game. Thank you, Konstantinas, for very inspiring comments as usual. Um, and articulating early on that socio-technical systems are not purely technical, that values must be translated into useful practices for engineer, and that a partnership between policymakers and engineers is, need is needed. Um, so now I'll turn to Lucila Scioli. Uh, Lucila, you are the Director for Artificial Intelligence and Digital Industry within the European Commission's Directorate General for Communications, Networks, Content and Technology, or DG Connect, as we, as we all know it. Um, in April this year, uh, the European Commission released an AI package, in, including uh, the EC review of the coordinated plan and for AI and the proposal for an AI act to promote the development and deployment of innovative and trustworthy AI systems in the EU. Um, while it's a package and all the pieces are important for the purpose of today's discussion, um, could you tell us about the regulations proposal to regulate high-risk AI systems 
and about the role of standards and benchmarks to implement this particular regulation. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the question and for inviting me to this event. Um, I have some slides. Uh, shall I show them? I hope you can uh, see them. Can you see them? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So um, I just 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 to start this this conversation on the standardization and the European framework on AI. I just would like to to simply to recall that standardization has always been playing a leading role in the European Union policies in particular for the creation of the single market. So it is a fundamental piece for us to, to make sure that we have competition, that we have interoperability, um, that we, we are able to reduce cost in our procedure. And so we give a lot of importance to our capabilities in the area of standardization. And we do that also for AI, because effectively what happens in the European Union is that we have a piece of legislation and in the legislation, we um, one way of implementing the legislation is to mandate um, standardization organizations for standards. And once we, we have the standards that we can publish them in the official journal, then these are considered harmonized standards and they can really simplify the way we implement legislation in the single market. Every year we publish a union work program for standardization. And if you look at the 2021 list of um, items that say to, 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 to be discussed for standardization, you will find artificial intelligence. And uh, um, effectively, um, you know, the, the harmonized standards, uh, as I said, it's a common practice in the single market. Um, uh, they, they are developed with recognized European standard organizations, which in the European Union are SEN, SENELEC, or ETSI. Um, uh, having said that, uh, uh, we also work with international standardization organization, and maybe we'll have the chance later to discuss the importance of having internationally agreed standards. Uh, but what is important is that the European Commission can actually table a request to this European standards organization to, for the development of standards. And this is important because in our um, single market legislation, if uh, uh, there are harmonized standards and companies can refer to the use of those harmonized standards, this creates a presumption on conformity with legal requirements of uh, uh, EU harmonized legislation. And this is very important because it allows to reduce cost, in particular for small medium enterprises, and it simply simplifies processes. Now, how do we apply this to the Artificial Intelligence Act? As you probably know, the Artificial Intelligence Act is an act that follows uh, and is built on our, let's say, product safety legislation. The panel before us discussed this, so whether this was the appropriate approach. Of course, we think it's the appropriate approach, but this is not what I'm going to discuss here. Uh, but simply to say that product safety is uh, uh, an area and the legislation in the commission, which is uh, which relies on the use of harmonized standards. And so what we require in the AI legislation, which is built around the concept of C marking basically, is that before high risk artificial intelligence systems are put on the market, and of course the legislation has a list of what we consider to be high risk use cases, those applications have to be checked by conformity, um, uh, um, through conformity assessment, and it has to be, and they have to be checked on the basis of a list of requirements, which are the five requirements that you see on this slide. Uh, the requirements that uh, uh, the data sets are of quality, that there is appropriate technical documentation, there is transparency and in information that is given to the users, there is human oversight, and that robustness, accuracy, and cybersecurity have been checked. So in order to um, uh, show compliance with these requirements, which are actually requirements that come from the work of the high-level expert group on artificial intelligence, and so they have been demonstrated to be uh, implementable, 
um, uh, we would like to work with standardization organizations to be able to develop standards that would, of course, uh, facilitate the compliance process of enterprises in terms of these particular requirements. And uh, uh, we are at the moment uh, mapping the standardization work that has been done on artificial intelligence, and that is a very large amount of work because a lot of things have already been done. And then we are engaging with European standardization organizations as well as with international standardization organizations to um, organize further work and be able really to come up with a set of standards that will really facilitate the implementation of the Artificial Intelligence Act. And we have a couple of years in front of us to be able to do that. So this is, I think, one of the main occupations we'll have in the near future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lucila, for this uh, comprehensive review. Um, I now turn to Constant. Uh, Con Constant, sorry, you were French, I guess. Uh, Constant, your account manager at uh, Sen and Senelec, the European Committee for Standardization that brings together the national standardization bodies of 34 European countries uh, that Lucila just mentioned. Um, and as Lucila mentioned, the EU is looking to Sen Senelec to support the deployment of uh, standards for trustworthy AI in Europe. Um, can you tell us about the status of standards work um, to implement the regulation? What are the top priorities for you? Um, what it, why uh, is multi-stakeholder participation in standards making uh, important? You mentioned that as a priority for Sensitinec at present, uh, especially when dealing with industry legislative and societal requirements in this case, and how can you make it happen? Uh, over to you, Constant. Thank you very much, and um, good evening, good afternoon to, to everybody. Um, and first, I would like to thank you very much for inviting Sans and Lang to, to this panel. It's really my, my great honor to, to be with you uh, today. So um, in order to, to, um, to provide some elements of feedback uh, to your question, uh, I think it's important to, uh, to, um, to recap what Sans and Lang are about, about uh, European standardization organization. As you mentioned, we bring together the national standardization bodies and national committees of 34 European countries to develop European standards and, and some European standardization deliverables. Uh, and it's very important to note that once a European standard is adopted in Europe, it becomes the national standards of uh, the different uh, countries in Europe, of, the, of our 34 members, removing any conflicting standard and therefore supporting the, the consolidation of, of the single market. Because it's true that as European standardization um, organization, we have been created specifically to support uh, the European single market. And also with a focus, a particular focus on the uh, international alignment with ISO and IC, uh, for which we enjoy specific agreement with ISO and IC to, to work on the development of, uh, of a common standard. And this is why, uh, on the other hand, we also aim at underpinning European legislation and policies, and that's why we are committed to a strong, resilient, and, and sustainable economy uh, in that respect, thanks to, uh, to standards and, and, and standardization delivery. So I don't think uh, I will um, underline the, the specific quality in, in, of standards in that respect, but as you know, it's very important, as I mentioned, for the consolidation of the single market to strengthen the competition of uh, the competitiveness of European companies and to create the, the condition for, for economic growth. Also, we'd like to refer to the Sensenec Strategy 2030, which has been uh, published a couple of months ago and, and which really pro uh, provide a focus on, on those topics, especially on the green and digital transition with a, a dedicated focus on artificial intelligence. And that's why uh, the European standardization uh, system, which is made of Sensenec and also ETSI, which is the third European standardization uh, organization, is very unique in the world because it is defined by the strong public and private partnership and also by this strong alignment with international standardization in, in ISO and IT. And that's why uh, with all our different stakeholders, which are not limited to industry uh, representative, but also societal organization at national or European level, we develop uh, market-driven standards, uh, which focus also on the inclusiveness. That's why it's very important that uh, all relevant stakeholders, people, citizens are involved in the standardization process, and especially when we talk about artificial intelligence, because it has an impact on, on the life of the people. So it's very important to, uh, to, to be transparent, open, and consensus-based 
Those are the key principles of Sensenec of European standardization. This is true for all sectors, but uh, this is uh, especially true when we will be uh, discussing the development of standards for, for artificial intelligence. And that's why, uh, as I mentioned, in terms of priority, um, I, I will mention three of them. The, the first one is to continue the work uh, we have been doing with the European Commission in anticipation of the future regulation. This is something that is really key because uh, in order to provide good quality standards and inclusive standards, we will have and we need to anticipate uh, as much as possible what is coming next. So indeed, we can rely on a strong cooperation with the European Commission service, which are responsible of this file. And we have regular dialogue to make sure that we can anticipate to the platform and the measure in place to be ready to deliver once the, the regulation will be, uh, will be adopted. So I mentioned this cooperation with the European Commission, but for that, I also would like to mention the, the, the cooperation with all relevant stakeholders, industry stakeholders, but also societal stakeholders. And within Sensenec, we do have specific processes in place to make sure that um, all those different stakeholders are involved at the right level. And for that, it's important to note the role of the national standardization bodies and national committees, which are, who are aware of the, of the national, of the local realities, and who knows uh, the different stakeholders uh, that need to be involved. As a second priority, I would like to mention the development of standards themselves. Of course, as you can imagine, uh, we work closely with ISO, IEC, GTC1, SC42 on uh, artificial intelligence, which has already developed some standards. And that's why at Sensenec, uh, we are reviewing a couple of, of the standards to uh, select those that can be adopted as European standard. And of course, since we have this role of underpinning European policies and legislation, uh, we stand ready to develop what we call homegrown European standards that will specifically target uh, specific uh, European needs uh, in that respect. Um, as a third priority, I also would like to, to mention the ecosystem as such. Uh, and for that, I'm notably thinking about the integration of research projects into standardization. There are a lot of very interesting uh, research projects in Europe. Uh, for which uh, the work can be transferred into standardization. I believe this is also something that can be for the successful development of standards in support of European legislation. And I also would like to, to mention uh, the cooperation with other standards developing organizations. Uh, for instance, IEEE, with whom we have started some uh, workshop activities, for instance, on the concept of uh, digital sovereignty and the impact on uh, standardization and European and international standardization. So it's a very interesting piece of work. Uh, we, we work in the past with NIST on, on smart grid cybersecurity. I got good memories on that. And of course, as we always say in, in, in Sensenec, there's no digitalization without cooperation. So it's very important to be uh, as inclusive as possible. And just to mention uh, again, to underline the role of harmonized standard, which was uh, indicated by the previous speaker, Indeed, it's very important that Sensenec, following a request by the European Commission, will not be alone in the that process, basically. We will continue to work with the European Commission, who is responsible for checking the legal compliance of the standards before they are cited in the official journal. We are working with the national committees, uh, with the societal stakeholders, consumer organizations, uh, representatives of environmental interests as well, and, and workers. Uh, at European level through the so-called annex organization, but also at national level through the, through the different uh, national committees. So uh, to, to uh, conclude on my intervention, I, I would say that the, the work is, go is ongoing, is going well. Uh, we have established a new technical committees, Joint TC21 on artificial intelligence last year, which mirrors the activities of ISYC, GTC1, SC42, and which has the possibility uh, to develop specific standards in support of the future regulation uh, on AI, and for which we have created a different uh, working group, uh, putting in place basically the, the structure to, uh, to support this dialogue with the, the Commission and stakeholders to, to deliver standards on time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Constant. Uh, and we now turn across the Atlantic to the United States, um, to Elam. Elam, you are the Chief of Staff of the US National Institute for Standards and Technology, or NIST. Uh, could you tell us about uh, NIST's priorities and work to date on AI, including the recent launch of the a process to develop a framework to manage risks to individuals, organizations, and society associated with AI? 
um, and tell us about your work uh, and focus on terminology, evaluation, and measurement more broadly. Over to you, Ellen. Thank you, Karen. I have to apologize for my voice. I've lost my voice and in, in, in return, in terms of taking it back, I have this course voice. But uh, in terms of AI, what we're doing, uh, a little bit about NIST, that NIST has a uh, broad portfolio of research and a long history on cultivating trust in technology. And we do that by advancing measurement science and participating in standard development uh, activities. Uh, we bring the technical contributions to standard development discussions to make sure that the standards are developed in a uh, technically sound manner and they are so scientifically valid. And sometimes we run evaluations to provide that sort of um, technical evidence for uh, uh, and quantitative support for standard development. In terms of AI, again, continuing the tradition of cultivating trust in AI, in, in technology, that's uh, really important for the AI. Uh, I, I caught up with a little bit of the last panel and there were discussions and you know the uh, last thought of the last panel was, uh, AI brings a lot of uh, potential for uplift and empower people uh, if it's uh, developed and implemented responsibly. Um, so it's important to understand AI risk and their driver. And uh, there is uh, many really good uh, uh, documents on AI principles to ensure that AI is developed and implemented responsibly and aligned with human rights and human well being and civil liberties. Um, Something, some opportunity for us, the tech community, is to take this value-based statement and bring them lower down and translate them into technical requirements uh, or socio-technical requirements uh, so that the uh, AI actors at different stages of the AI life cycle, at the designing level, at the developer, at the evaluations, um, give them the right lexicon, the right tools, the right resources to talk about risk. So what we're doing, and that's all part of the development of the risk management, um, the work started about two, two or two and a half years ago, and then sort of codified um, with congressional mandate to develop the AI risk management framework. But our approach to this is that first, uh, bring the community together to answer the question of what constitutes for trust or trustworthiness. In other words, try to come up with what is the core building block of trustworthiness and define them again in source of a technical uh, lingo. Um, we have been working with the uh, community. I've been sitting in many of your meetings and learning from a lot of you. And we have come up with, e, with eight dimensions and all of these, of course, is uh, yet out there for uh, public comments. And uh, these are all aligned with the, uh, some of the work happening as, as uh, Constantine talked about at IEEE. I saw uh, uh, IEC SC42. Um, so the first thing that we want to do is to bring um, community on the agreement of uh, these are the risks, this is the taxonomy of risk, and then help them build a um, uniform, uh, interoperable uh, lexicon and language to communicate risk. So we all agree that we want AI systems to be accurate, but uh, more than that, we want it to be secure or resilient to different uh, vulnerabilities. We want them to be robust, generalizable to the um, conditions, environments, data are not seen during the training. We want them to be reliable. We want it to be safe. We want it to be um, uh, the bias and uh, harmful impact of the bias uh, be minimized. We want them to be explainable and interpretable. But then when we come up, when we agree on this taxonomy of risk, uh, we need to bring the community on the shared understanding of what each of them mean. Uh, some of the terms such as explainability and interpretability are much more challenging to, to get a um, common uh, understanding around them. But even terms such as bias that has been in the um, uh, dictionary or language of the technical and statistical people um, can mean different things to different mean people. So come up with the taxonomy of risk, come up with the shared understanding of what each of them mean. These will give us the basis of what it is that we want to measure so we can move on on how to measure and that's extremely important. There was a lot of discussions about evaluations here. Many of us at NIST have this code from Lord Kelvin on our wall that says, uh, if you can't measure it, you can't improve it. So if you want to improve uh, the trustworthiness of the system, if you want to improve um, the AI systems, we need to be able to know how to measure, um, starting by uh, what it is that we want to measure. All of these things are the uh, foundations or uh, 
uh, steps needed to development of the AI risk management framework. Ideally, we would want it to um, uh, build stronger research programs around all of this be, uh, be, uh, uh, before embarking on development of the AI risk management uh, framework, but we completely understand the urgency of that uh, and the need for having that sort of tools. Uh, so, um, AI risk management framework and the uh, effort that we uh, launched uh, by a request for information and then follow up by workshop and several other engagement is, is really a, a open, uh, transparent, uh, consensus driven, uh, open to participation with everybody across uh, the globe uh, in understanding risk and communicating risk of AI. Uh, it is uh, absolutely our intention and uh, we will do the extra, go the extra mile to make sure that we align it not only with um, other documents around AI risk management framework, OECD has done several good works, IEEE, uh, uh, SD42, but also uh, with other uh, uh, research and work done on uh, around risk management framework uh, uh, for, for non-AI, because ultimately for AI risk management to be uh, incorporated and actually be implemented, it should be easily adopted and, and be, be able to integrate it into the broader enterprise risk management. So uh, what we are trying to do is really, I would call them the pre-standardization research. Uh, do the research to make sure that we have the right uh, technical contributions and quantitative data to support development of the technically sound uh, standards. Uh, standard is part of our name, it's our middle name, but we are not a standard development organization such as ISO or IEEE. Instead, we work with them, we participate in their meeting and we contribute our um, uh, uh, our, our research. And uh, last thing I'll, I'll again emphasize is that um, we uh, plan and carry our work in uh, collaboration and coordination with uh, everybody. And that is uh, a very, very, very important integral to our success. Uh, we have really smart people at NIST, but we don't have all of the answers. So we can succeed if we don't uh, collaborate and participate uh, and coordinate with everyone. Thank you, Karin, back to you. Thank you very much, Alan. And I think many as of us uh, around the, the table, so to speak, the virtual table, uh, agree on, on the importance of a lexicon of language that we agree on, um, and also on the importance of any risk management framework being easy uh, to adopt for all types of, uh, of actors, organizations, be they uh, large or small. Um, so last but not least, we uh, turn to Huno. Um, who to provide us with a national perspective from France. Uh, Renaud, uh, you are France's national coordinator for AI. Um, you contributed recently to the revision of the French AI strategy that was published just a few weeks ago. Uh, could you tell us uh, what is the role of standards and benchmarks for trustworthy AI from a national perspective in France? Um, and could you mention in specific initiatives like, like the Confiance.ai initiative that, that we've heard a lot about, at least here in France, um, uh, and, and also the, the, uh, the French National Lab for Measurement, Benchmarking and Testing to Evaluate AI Systems, also known as LNE here, um, and how that, you know, uh, what's, what, how that has helped, you know, advance or is helping advance um, uh, certification process and accreditation and how it links with the French AI strategy. Bruno, over to you. Hello, Karin. Uh, hello, everybody. Of course, from a, a French a national viewpoint, I, I share the vision of the regional or global players who have just followed one another. And I totally concur that the voluntary standardization of AI is both a major challenge and a major lever for the, de for the sound development of AI. And consequently, our national AI strategy gives it a substantial place. Uh, we think in France that standards are powerful enablers of, of sound economic uh, and balanced development of AI. They are often more appropriate and granular than legislative horizontal tools. Those are necessary, but then you have to go deeper and more precisely in each domain. And it's, this is also why we very much support the, the European subsidiarity way of, uh, of, uh, of approaching this and the new legislative framework and the recognition officially of, of the standards. And benchmarks are also very important 
because they are a prerequisite for a true technological transparency in the market. When you're a um, policymaker or when you're a buyer, uh, you want to buy uh, not the, the, the system uh, which uh, bears the apparent best performance, but you want to, uh, to, to detect whether it's the best inherently uh, tool and not the one that has had the chance to have already access to a, a large volume of set of data. And that can catch up and 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 super and 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 be and be better again, and also uh, of course as I was mentioning um, by Constantinos at the beginning, it's not only about uh, performance; it's also about socio-technical and and biases and debiasing uh, that are uh, embedded sometimes unconsciously in, into rules and data, uh, and also well-constructed benchmark and help detect those. This is why uh, since 2009, as early as uh, the beginning of our strategy, we launched a grand challenge uh, and a program which is called Confiance AI, which is securing, certifying and making reliable systems based on AI. We invested uh, 45 million euros over four years, both from public and private funding and with three pillars. And one of those three pillars is uh, standardization issues. The idea is that um, we need to mobilize the French ecosystem of uh, the standardization and make it follow very precisely all the technological work which is done to disseminate AI in industry with processes and methodologies. How do we characterize trust in many domain or technology sets or elements? Uh, how do we construct ex ante trust by a process of uh, multi-stakeholder uh, construction of AI? Then how do you make engineering of data information knowledge, which is not uh, the traditional way of uh, how engineering works with formal proofs, uh, then all the IVVQ strategies and also the, the, the embedded AI issues that are very uh, challenging also. Uh, so uh, Julien Chiaroni and Patrick Bezon, some, as some of you may know, uh, they are in charge of uh, mobilizing this, this ecosystem. Uh, just recently, last week, we commissioned in this uh, in this line of work uh, a study to the firm to the consultancy firm AY, and they confirmed that uh, the the importance of trustworthy and responsible AI for the French economy it could represent at as much as two thirds of the share of the AI market in seven industrial financial and insurance production fields, and and many of these systems will fall under critical or complex or high risk uh, risk AI in the sense of the open regulation. So it's very, very important to us that we, we prepare ourselves, that we be ready. And at the moment, we, we know that only 10 to 15 percent of companies have truly industrialized AI solutions in, in these sectors. So there's a, still a huge gap and lots of economic challenges. And so not uh, very originally, uh, the grand challenge, the, the Confiance AI program has set a national roadmap. Uh, and we welcome and we used all the in incredible work that has been done at the H by the HLEG at the European level, uh, at the OECD, and also uh, at different bodies like IEEE and, and their repository also, which is very uh, useful. Uh, we also conducted a survey uh, to engage and we, we, and we got 261 uh, answers uh, uh, also from uh, foreign uh, players. And finally, all this work uh, has mobilize resources to be able to participate because the idea is not only to mobilize the French ecosystem, the idea is that the French ecosystem can truly participate to, to a much larger uh, endeavor. And so that's why we partner with DIN uh, uh, to uh, to take some responsibilities at, at the Sense and Elec, uh, GTC 21 group. Uh, and that's that's how we, we see the thing. And finally, uh, you mentioned LNE, Laboratoire National d'Essai. Uh, we have to be uh, quite modest and clear. Uh, this is the first floor, uh, a certification not of, of a real hard uh, AI system functioning, but more of the process that a company, uh, how a company develops AI. So now uh, some, some firms that want to, uh, to, to prove to their clients that they, are, that they are sensible, that they are not going to do something uh, very light uh, with, without uh, proper thinking. They can go to LNE and and and, um, and ask to be assessed and certified about their design system from from development designs, evaluation and, and maintenance in operational conditions of the systems of AI. So it's not a question of system of software certification, but the developers' serious organization of the process of developing AI. And the audited processes are quite concrete. 
the capacity to translate these into functional specifications, the organization of quality of databases, the conduct of learning processes, and the development of evaluation methods and, and metrics. That, that's uh, how we approach uh, the challenges uh, of, uh, of um, trustworthy uh, standardization. But uh, we know that the road will be very long. Thanks a lot, Renaud. Um, so there's so much to, to be said, but uh, in view of the time, we have a half hour left and we have two more really important uh, sections of the panel to go through. So I want to straight away go to the second part of the panel, which I think is critical for all of us, which is about opportunities for international cooperation with a focus on cross-Atlantic cooperation, so cooperation obviously in standardization and benchmarking. Um, and Unfortunately, because we're running a little bit tight on time, we're going to have a little bit less time. So I'm going to ask you to keep your remarks a little briefer than originally planned. Um, and, and, uh, and I suspect that risk assessment and management and AI system lifecycle approaches will be core parts of this discussion on baselines for international interoperability. And in all these areas, luckily, we're not starting from scratch, uh, as was previously said. Um, so. I'd like to start with you, Renaud, um, uh, by asking you to tell us about France's priorities for international cooperation on standards and benchmark, particularly as French, France uh, soon, very soon, takes over uh, the, uh, EC, uh, the, sorry, the EU Council presidency. And what role do you see for different SDOs, standards development organizations like uh, AFNO and France, uh, Sentinelec, IEEE, ISO, and others? We've had some elements of responses, but from an, we'd be uh, interested in hearing you know, the national perspective on this. Uh, do, you these, do these organizations as complementary, or do you see some duplication or areas of improvement? Where should we focus our efforts towards interoperability? Uh, and what are you hearing from French companies um, on uh, working in AI and operating internationally? Over to you, Bruno. Well, I'll try to be briefer. Uh, well, in fact, uh, the taking over the French presidency of the EU Council uh, means that we, you have to be, on, to be on the reserve. You have to, to, to leave other members and you have to be the balance. So uh, it's not, a, it's not a, a way, it's not a, a time when you can uh, lead or put your, your own uh, inputs. Uh, that, but that's, that's the best way uh, how Europe works. I think it's unavoidable that the work is carried out at all three levels of uh, geographical scale, national, European and international. And I don't think those uh, levels are contradictory. I think they just uh, comfort each other. So I think it's a very good thing. And often we replicate and we take ideas from others and it's uh, the, the best way to do. Uh, it's better to compare uh, yourself with others. So it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a major utility, I think. Of course, sometimes uh, cross fertilization will have some gaps and some some a bit of friction, but that's the that's the normal way. Uh, the the second um, important issue is that I uh, and the firms uh, French firms tell, tell us that as AI is a general purpose technology, there will be a huge amount of work to be done to bring together all the vertical and horizontal logics. And this is true in legislation, and this is also true in standardization. You have a lot of sectorial and domain standardization. And it will be very, very difficult to think about everything and to and to make all the pieces of the puzzle to, to fit together. But that's we, we can't avoid it and we have to do it. And um, and finally, uh, I would also want to stress and, and companies are very keen uh, to us and they, they ask a lot about it. Like we have to, to, to face it like legislation, standardization is not an agile process. It has a lot of advantages. It's precise, it's multi-party, it's carefully drafted, but it is not agile. So it means that both in standardization and in legislation, we'll need to adapt to the pace of innovation and also we need to leave room for, for, for technology. For example, in, in Europe, we are lagging behind in investment and development of AI, and we are setting us to ourselves very important goals, which are for the rule of law. But we need to leave those uh, spaces for innovation. And this is a really critical point. And the last uh, remark I would like to make is the voice of startups. Usually, they don't participate much into normalization and standardization processes. And at the moment in AI, they bring a lot to innovation. That's a huge challenge. And in France, we are always already thinking about it. How do, how do we do that? That's why we issued a, a, a tender 
to, uh, to, to select 12 uh, startups that will be announced soon to participate to this uh, Confiance.ai program. And we'll probably fund also a position in our Startup National Association to make the link on those topics. But, that, but that's very difficult to, uh, to, to, to bring in uh, startups. Thank you, um, I'm, I'm going to quickly go over to Lucila. Um, could you, Lucila, share with us your thoughts on international interoperability between EU member states and also with like-minded countries, uh, such as OECD member countries, those are the ones I think about, uh, of course, because I work at the OECD, um, uh, particularly those across the Atlantic that are uh, more heavily represented uh, in this panel. Um, and how is the EU cooperating with regional and international standards bodies? Uh, and also what's the role for bilateral uh, cooperation um, uh, as there are several programs have already been mentioned and, and that are ongoing. Um, should we be trying to bake in interoperability into our compliance and assurance frameworks by design? And if yes, uh, what do you see as some of the key buildings, building blocks to do that? Well, thanks. So first, let me say, um, linked to my previous intervention, that uh, uh, the fact that we ask European standardization organization to develop standards to support um, the requirements of the European Artificial Intelligence Act, we, it doesn't mean that uh, harmonized European standards are only, uh, by definition, European standards. In fact, we um, have, there are appropriate agreements in place between uh, European standardization organization and international standardization organizations. And so uh, we often use international standards at the European level. Actually, I think that uh, we tend to develop European only standards when international standards are not uh, really developed. And so, for example, um, Recently, there has been an approval at uh, uh, ISO level of uh, a new work item on uh, biometric identification standard, uh, which we welcome very much. Um, now, it's obvious that in this work, we need to work with uh, like-minded partners. And, uh, and of course, we work, uh, we have uh, standardization dialogues uh, with uh, um, like-minded partners that we often meet in the OECD meetings, as you say, but also I want to uh, say hello also to uh, Elam Tabassi because we meet uh, in the meetings of the TTC. The TTC is the Trade and Technology Council between the European Union and the United States. And we have discussions now with, with NIST on artificial intelligence. And I hope we can do something together, not on standards, like she said, uh, uh, but uh, on the measurements and tools that we can um, together try to, to find a way of uh, successfully measuring some important element of trustworthy AI. But you know, there is a lot of um, um, uh, movement in the standardization artificial intelligence. There are many actors involved, and um, which is very positive. But at the same time, we have to make sure that all these parallel tracks are not uh, uh, creating inconsistent solutions and are not uh, duplicating all the efforts that we have to do. So I, I just conclude by saying that I welcome very much the example of uh, an initiative that has been put in place by the OECD to create a database that provides um, the AI actors and the policymakers with comparable information on tools and methods uh, and standards which have been developed worldwide uh, to, to implement trustworthy AI in different contexts. I think this is a very useful initiative and, um, and I, I hope uh, in any case that we will continue this kind of discussions also in the OECD. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Lucy. That, that's our core priority, one of our core priorities right now, and we, 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 uh, we're working with partners. It's just as an aparte, it's, it's very easy to set up a database of tools. Um, and as I was mentioning a bit earlier in the conversation, it's, it's, it's easy to set up the, the database, it's easy to set up the fields, the structure, et cetera. What's hard is making sure that setting in the processes to make sure that this database or this catalog of tools is constantly up to date without which it's not very useful. And so 
that's what we've been focusing on for the past year is really how do we make sure that this uh, catalog of tools is remains up to date, contains useful information, and you know what, and that it's actually uh, maintainable. Um, so thank you for that, and we really look forward to working with the with the commission and others on that. Um, so now I'll, I'll turn to Constant. To, sorry, Constant. I keep um, calling you Constant to Constant and with LM both. Uh, to ask you both the same question. So first, Constant, and then Alam, uh, what do you see as best practices or at least good practices for cooperation between uh, po policymakers and standards development organizations at the European, US, and broader international levels? Um, what are some of the key challenges you encounter, if any? Uh, and I'm sure there are a few. <laughs> and are uh, coming across related to aligning uh, international and regional standardization efforts? So, so constant. Yeah, thank, thank you very much in this for, for, for this question. Um, starting with the cooperation between standardization organization and, and uh, European policy makers, I think it was underlined the, uh, before the, the role of the NLF, the new legislative framework uh, for in which uh, the European Commission issues a request to SENSENEC and then SENEC develop uh, voluntary standards that are cited in the official journal. There are different checks and balances in that respect. And I think that's a uh, a good, um, good uh, practice in terms of cooperation. And this is something that is uh, quite uh, unique in the world and that has been very uh, important in terms of the, the consolidation of the, of the single market. And as it was mentioned, indeed, for having standards cited in the official journal that give presumption of conformity, it does not have to be pure European standard. It can also uh, be international standards that have been adopted as, as European standards. So that's for, for the cooperation with uh, policymakers. Between SDOs, I would say that when it comes to SENSENEC, we have this uh, natural links uh, with ISO and IEC through the national standardization body and national committees to involve uh, at international le level on, on topics that are also of interest for Europe. So the collaboration over there is, uh, is very strong between the national standardization body and national committees. I will also mention some bilateral agreement that SEN and SENEC have with some uh, different regions in the world, in particular the US, which is always something uh, super useful to understand the different challenges that are being faced, uh, the work that is ongoing and how uh, priorities, for instance, can be aligned. And last but not least, in terms of cooperation with uh, European and international SDOs, I would like to mention the European Commission's uh, multi-stakeholder platform on, on ICT standardization, which brings together a representative for European and international SDOs the European standardization organization, but also European member states and, of course, the European Commission to, uh, to discuss on, on, on relevant ICT related standardization topics. The one on AI has been on the agenda of uh, multiple meetings of the, of the MSP and which has been uh, very key to, to advance uh, on this topic. Thank you. Alan? Yeah, I'll be very uh, quick and saying that uh, yeah, let's see, uh, uh, the, thanks for the shout out and, and, and happy to work there. Um, I, 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 I think I, I'm just going to go and uh, insist on um, uh, standard development based on quantitative data. So, um, and you know, we, we hear about evidence based policy making and the very same thing. So, uh, uh, one, one way of doing this is make sure that, you know, uh, uh, the researchers are involved, and, and one thing that has worked for us in, in uh, uh, Syria mentioned the biometrics, and that's the area I'm coming from, is running evaluations um, to understand where is the limits and capabilities of technology uh, that allow for uh, development of standards that are uh, that are um, technically sound, but also provide. Uh, uh, the right information and the right evidence for uh, good policy making. And so I'll, I'll, I'll just emphasize on the, uh, we call them pre-standardization research. And I think that, that would be good to uh, do a lot of collaborations around that. And something that can be done is um, uh, come up with, uh, again, you know, uh, we talk about the importance of the terminology and taxonomy, but also on the metrics, right? So. Uh, uh, agree on the metrics. We, again, talking about the importance of the evaluations, we run it in the you know with the academic papers a lot that uh, uh, they come and you know you, you see it and you they they tell you that this works really well. But uh, in uh, 
uh, we don't really know uh, everything about how the evaluations was done. Uh, uh, not even uh, all the information is about the metrics, but even more importantly, the data that used for the testing, right? The data is easy, everybody passes, the data is difficult, everybody fails. So I think one area that would be very good is, is um, advancing uh, uh, measurement science, advancing evaluations, have a better understanding on, on again, what to measure, how to measure, and, and a sort of standardized way of, uh, 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 getting the right data for test, getting the right metric for test, uh, the, the standardized methodology, but also standardized reporting of the results. Um, and, and that would be good for standard development, that would be good for policy making as well. Um, in terms of your second questions about uh, alignment of the national and international uh, uh, most of the work that we're doing is, is around, you know, contribution to the ISO and there are international standards, but I completely understand that. Um, I agree with what, uh, what Konstantin said at the beginning of the call, that uh, more players, uh, a, a stronger ecosystem of standard development organizations is better for the community. Uh, it's also important to uh, align and uh, keep the liaison and understanding, so make sure that they are all uh, going in the same direction. Thanks, Alam. Um, Constantino, so I'll turn over to you. It's basically a, a, the same question. Um, if, uh, you know, Judge Fred, maybe react to Constant and Alam um, and, and, and tell us what you see as the role for uh, cooperation globally. Uh, uh, and cross Atlantic um, and gaps and challenges and how we can address them. And Thank you. Whether you agree with what Constantin and Ellen said. So a short comment because there has been a discussion in the chat about what is AI, and I've been using the term also, and I'm very critical to this term. I find OECD's approach very intelligent, which was. Uh, to give a description what is an AI system, a system approach, without going into what is AI, which is a metaphysical question. I really recommend to use the OECD's approach. I very much like it. AI can be anything, so you don't bother. But an AI system has certain characteristics and so on. I find this very, very good. Now about international cooperation. To cooperate, you must have partners. And we are very pleased to see now that almost everybody uh, every standardization organization, also national ones, explicitly address the contextual aspects of AI systems. This was not so six years ago. Now it is happening, and we're very pleased to see this. And uh, we offer our cooperation to everyone, and this can have really different uh, directions and dimensions. As Constant mentioned, we are uh, working now together with Sensenelec, bringing our expertise and our assets to Saint Senelec and offering them to use them the way they see fit for the purposes. We started and we offer this also to national bodies and we are ready to take what they have done and work on them further. The big question is how we can combine the global intelligence with the local and regional one. And we need to do this to succeed. And for us, there is no the not invented here principle. If somebody does something which is good, we ask them, can we use it? So we expect others who see what we do and they like it to just ask us to have it. And we're going to give it because it is very important. We can, nobody can do it alone. And we have to work together. Now, regarding uh, the transatlantic dimension, we are a global organization. And we were very cautious not to favor one region over the others. And uh, we have really fantastic uh, participation from everywhere. I must say, however, that for these specific issues we are talking here, the Europeans are very active. And almost all our standards projects are led by Europeans. And we have a fantastic participation from Europe. And the whole intelligence comes from Europe because they, somehow they understand this. Historically, I don't know what are the reasons. And also we have about 40% women participating, which is a fantastic uh, number for any standardization project. Usually it is 5%. And in, in this project, we have 40%. And most of the leaders are women because it's about the context, probably. So, but 
still there is an affinity transatlantic. And I am not ashamed of saying this. We share common political values because it is also about defending our democracy towards technology. Because as somebody said in the previous panel, uh, technology undermines democracy very clearly. We see this happening. So what can we do as technical people to work against this? And we can do. So we have a shared value. This is why with uh, Paul Nemitz, we published a manifesto, how we can defend democracy in the times of AI. This was not a coincidence. And I, am, uh, as, uh, I was one of the two people who started this. So we can do something and we should do this. We should protect our core values. And for the West, it is democracy. Yeah? And we have really to say this very clearly and to defend it towards any other uh, attempts. So, but uh, beyond this, I would not uh, favor any specific region, but I have to state that uh, regarding these uh, matters, the Europeans are very active within our system and, uh, uh, and we very much like it. And I stop it here. And it is not about interoperability here because it is not Wi-Fi. We can have, uh, let's say, systems designed with different values and work in different regions. Here we have more flexibility than with classical interoperability, I must say. So we should not be too much worried about interoperability in this context. Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you, Konstantinos. Um, that was very, very well said. Um, I, we have just a few minutes left. Uh, we have eight minutes left. Um, and I think what we want, well, the, the, this last part of the panel is very important. This is about uh, really summarizing our top priorities moving forward again uh, over the next one to three years, uh, which is literally tomorrow. Um, and, uh, um, and ask, so I'd like to ask each of our distinguished panelists to write quick, literally, you know, one or two minutes summary of the top three points, three sentences or points, three priorities or points to keep in mind for ensuring effective AI standards and benchmarks over the short term, again, one to three years out, uh, including, including what does success look like for each of you, meaning what should we have done or at least started to do by the time we reconvene a year from now uh, at the fourth edition of the Athens Roundtable. Um, so Lucila, could I start with you first? Thank you. So uh, I think that for the next uh, two or three years, uh, we are certainly, um, uh, um, you know, before the, the, the Artificial Intelligence Act in the European Union enters in force, we, we are working hard on the development of standards and we really would like to have some European harmonized standards that really help the, also the smaller enterprises in uh, uh, participating to, to the artificial intelligence market. And if you ask me what are the most important things in terms of standardization, I think that it will be very important to ensure the involvement of the appropriate stakeholders, also of the regulators, because uh, if uh, the regulators, the stakeholders and the, the standardization organization don't work together, they, they, it will be difficult to deliver good quality standards that we can actually use in practice. And then I think that uh, measurement is important, that was already said, but also that pre-standardization activities are used. And so that we, we find the balance between being in a hurry and needing the standards as soon as possible and taking a good time to make sure that the quality is there. Thank you very much, um, Lucila. Um, so next, uh, we'll turn to Renaud. Um, My wish is that uh, we are able to win the race that separates us between the now and the entry in force of our future obligations, which are which are very noble. This means having actionable standards. This means ha having trusted operational tools that are linked to those standards and developed by bodies. And that also means, uh, as, as I was said by, um, by Lucilla, to have uh, regulators, especially those of Annex 2 in the AI regulation, that that are fit and, uh, and ready to embed AI. 
and uh, and really now we, we see in many organizations there's a, a hard time moving from data science to production and then we'll need to go from production to a life cycle management and that's a huge uh, challenge thank you very much. Alan, can I turn to you? Yes, I'll be brief. Measurement, if you cannot measure it, you cannot improve it. And number two, inclusivity, as uh, Lucilla said, we want everybody from, you know, diversity of thought, we want um, computer scientists, mathematicians, statisticians, but also cognitive scientists, psychologists, lawyers, uh, regulators, policy makers uh, around the table from the beginning of the discussion. And uh, we also want uh, diversity of demographics. We want to know um, um, uh, the, the possible harms if you don't have, if you don't reach out to everyone. As what so we're gonna be doing in the, up to next year, I hope I have uh, good reports on the advances on the AI risk management framework by the next time we meet. Uh, uh, great discussion, thanks for having me. Thank you, Alan. Uh, Constant, over to you. And indeed, thank you. And uh, I can only support the, the statement that were provided by, by the previous speaker. When, when it comes to a sense and perspective, definitely it will be about uh, making available standards that are fit for purpose and especially harmonized standards because harmonized standards are the priority of sense and and even more in this uh, topic. And so I believe we have an important momentum to, to bring around the table other relevant stakeholders, societal regulators, industry, etc. We, we need to keep this momentum and to work uh, all together towards common goals. Also, would like to add uh, something that was mentioned previously is this articulation between horizontal and vertical. This is also something that will be very important for, for the uptake of, of standards and AI solution in that respect. So I hope that from one year from now, we will have made good progress, uh, good significant progress when it comes to, to harmonize standards with our relevant stakeholders. Thank you. And Constantinos, le mot de la fin. <laughs> so, first of all, I must say that we are very happy with uh, how things are going because when we started six years ago, we were quite lonely. Now there are a lot of partners and people working in this direction. So this is very encouraging. Uh, at the secondary level, uh, we are the only one who has really, who is addressing explicitly the issue of dual use of uh, AI technologies for military and uh, also for civil purposes. And we have created a group of people who do a lot of work there. So if anybody's interested, please contact us because uh, nobody else has dared to go there and we, we are doing it. And third, I would like very much uh, to see the project that we are doing now with SenseNLX succeeding because it's very important for the future of our children. It's about how to protect the personal data online. And we have a fantastic standard there, which fits very good to a European regulation. So this would be something really to be propagated through Europe and then to the rest of the world through Europe. So this is my biggest uh, hope. Thank you very much, Constantinos. We do have time for two minutes left. So I was wondering if any of the panelists would like to reply to what others have said, um, for example, on the horizontal and vertical distinction. Is that, do we have consensus on the importance of this? Um, do we have, I, I think, I think I've, we've heard throughout the panel a lot of consensus on, on tools, on measurement, on uh, regulators and, and being fit for purpose uh, and the, life, the AI system life cycle uh, measurement uh, and cycle. Um, do you, would you like to react to one another's comments? I can say a few words uh, about benchmarking. I think it's extremely important. The work that NIST is doing there and also Sense Analytics is extremely important. And we can contribute with uh, the work we have done with uh, creating tools for assessing the quality of algorithmic systems. And also I agree with many comments on the chat that this cannot be one off because these are systems that are changing. So we need a process of how to certify the, let's say their quality, but keeping it open and uh, reviewing uh, periodically. So this is extremely important because this is not just a simple product we're talking about. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so we're at, 
at the end of our panel, and I'd like to thank uh, thank all of our excellent panelists and uh, Nicola, the Nicolas, actually the three Nicolas, um, uh, for for their excellent organization and for 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 convening this panel, um, and so to to everyone for sharing their insights with us today. Um, uh, <laughs> I will not try to summarize what we have heard today right now, but I'm very encouraged as well. And thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule and I wish you uh, best of health and happiness to all. Thanks again.